Well, that time of year has come around once again. Once again, I've been invited back to be a part of the annual series organised by Edge Science, known as Paleo Rewind, which is where an array of science content creators of varying backgrounds come together to document some of the most notable paleontology descriptions and discoveries of the year. This year, I'm covering the month of July, continuing on from Zach Smith who covered June, and you can watch his video right here in the top right hand corner if you're interested. After each creator involved has uploaded their video leading up to December 31st, a compilation video of all of the parts leading up to then will then be uploaded on Edge's channel, so to be sure to be on the lookout for that. To begin this video, in the present day, Tuatara stand alone as a sole surviving member of an order of lizard-like reptiles known as Rhynchocephalians, and it's a great surprise for many to learn that said group encompassed a wide range of different body plans and niches in their respective environments many millions of years ago with the snake-like pleurosaurs swimming through marine environments, and herbivorous alinodontines utilising their batteries of wide teeth to crunch through thick vegetation. This extends even to the treetops, as this paper published on July 2nd suggests, with a newly described species having some interesting adaptations that shows that this group was potentially even more diverse than previously thought. This animal was named as Phenodraco scandentis, with Sphino meaning wedge in ancient Greek and Draco being the Latin for dragon both being a reference to the clade of Sphenodontia, and also to the arboreal nature of the animals of which their limb proportions are most comparable, as we'll get into. Their species name of Scandentis is also derived from the Latin words meaning climber, which is also especially relevant. Getting to where they were found, they were discovered in the Songhofen limestone in the Altmuthal formation in Germany. Of course, Germany back in the late Jurassic 160 million years ago was a very different place, not being the temperate place it is today, but instead a tropical archipelago made up of many different islands. This area is known for many zones of oxygen in the area's lagoons, making it so that any animal that fell through the water column or swept into them after dying on land were then preserved in exceptional condition. With no scavengers or high currents about to rip apart and disarticulate carcasses, the bodies of the animals that lived in the area, including Sphina Draco, could drift down to the murky depths below in peace, then being covered in the soft muds at the bottom of the lagoons over time. This now means that what we have is a well-preserved little animal, and one that after being assessed was found to have some neat adaptations which they would be named after. Their limbs were found to be relatively long compared to that of other rhynchocephalians, and also to that of other living squamates, which were also included in the wider dataset, with Sphina Draco matching up the closest to the green crested lizards and Draco, both arboreal animals with very similar proportions. Their relatively longer forelimbs, elongated digits, as well as their recurved claws, is also something found in these arboreal lizards. Therefore, to sum things up briefly, Sphina Draco is regarded now as the first strictly arboreal rhynchocephalian known, something which expands our knowledge on their overall diversity, a diversity that has now sadly been lost to time. Continuing on, the mouthparts of filter-feeding whales are some of the most extreme and fascinating anatomical features in the animal kingdom and their adaptations make them impressive subjects to study for this reason. They're made even more exceptional in that the fossil record has scant evidence for any tetrapod that has the same kind of convergently evolved adaptation. That was until the discovery of Hupe Sucus, a small marine reptile from the early Triassic that seemed to fit all of the criteria of being similarly adapted and functionally filter feeding. Compared to bowhead whales, the case of their filter feeding prowess was mainly based on similarities that were noted by perceived similarities in their skull, being looked at through geometric morphometrics of the 2D landmarks they had present. However, such similarities, as published in a paper on July 4th, show that this perceived similarity wasn't really the case, as the initial studies involving Hupesuchus were deemed to have flawed methodology, most importantly and critically using a dataset of extant cetaceans that didn't match well with the morphology of respective species, with many unrealistic data points being found that with their flawed examination meant that Hupesuchus in fact didn't have any morphospace overlap with any of the study cetaceans, which therefore invalidates a filter feeding mode for them. Collecting a new set of landmarks for the study, the team involved with this paper set out to see how the results would change when using more accurate data along the original author's intentions. Something which was also assessed was the metabolism of Hupasuchus through some energetic studies, the results of which showed that a baleen whale style of feeding wouldn't be able to net them enough food to survive, given their only one metre long length, and not to mention their long neck, the lack of an intraoral space for baleen to be placed, 
and a comparatively small head are also not really traits that would be the most suitable for the often repeated ram feeding methods that baleen whales undertake to feed. Hoopasuchus does however show some convergences with pelicans, so some form of ram feeding is still potentially possible for them, though more work does need to be done to determine more of these specifics. The genus of Longus squama, found from middle through late Triassic rocks in Kazakhstan, is one of the strangest of all extinct animals, with them being known from a holotype that preserved the front half, which is overall quite lizard-like and fairly typical. What however isn't is their strange filament-looking structures at the top of their body, which are absolutely huge, and some researchers found them to be so strange that their conclusions were that there was some form of gliding structure, and in some cases, not even a part of them, instead being some kind of plant. However, most seem to suggest that there was some form of structure akin to but not the same as feathers, with them not having barbs and other features that make them up. This has therefore meant there has been a lot of debate in terms of what exactly these structures were used for, and also as to where Longus squama fit phylogenetically with other reptiles. With all of this, Longus squama was a huge enigma in paleontology, but the find of an animal recently that looks to be closely related has helped to expand our knowledge, and has helped to clear at least some things up. Described from rocks dating to 247 million years ago from the middle Triassic of France, new finds of both two preserved animals of the same species, as well as 80 other isolators and tegumentary appendages, similar to the striking ones found on Longus squama, were described. Named as Mirasaura gravoduli, their bird-like skull and overall anatomy suggest that them, and therefore Longus squama, are some form of Trypanosauromorph, animals that mostly took on arboreal forms and mimicked anteaters, like the Tamandua, in terms of their niche. Because of Mirasaurus' discovery, the development of complex integumentary appendages are now known more clearly to not just be restricted to avometatarsalans, or archosaurs closer to birds than to crocodiles, as well as mammalia forms, but as evolutionary roots right amongst basal amniotes, so this overall is a rather remarkable discovery and description. Velociraptor is, as we all know, one of the most famous dinosaurs of all time, boosted by the rather disparate Jurassic Park counterparts. But with their fame, their other closest relatives in their family of Dromaeosauridae do tend to be sidelined, which is a great shame, as they are a rather diverse family of animals that have a great range of body types and also habitat preferences. One of these animals is from the same region of the world that Velociraptor is from, being Sri Devi from Lake Cretaceous Mongolia, which was named after the Buddhist deity of the same name in 2021 which was described off of a partial postcranial skeleton from the Barn Goyot Formation, a site which is slightly younger than the one Velociraptor is found in, the Jagotta Formation. Shri, however, is now no longer a monotypic taxon, as a new species named as Shri Rapax was described in July, and from the bones we have, was a very clearly different animal in terms of their general proportions. Distinct from Shri Devu by way of vertebral, neck, and skull differences, Shri Repax, the species name meaning rapacious in Latin, named so after the hypertrophied first digits, which we got into, being well preserved and articulated, having an overall quite robust frame that set them apart from the closest relative, which was determined to be Velociraptor themselves. The main standouts from the finds are one, how complete and articulated they are, and two, the general frame of them being rather stocky in comparison to other Velociraptorines. Their first digit, for example, is especially impressive, as this claw is proportionally larger than is known of in any other Dromaeosaurid of which the Hansa preserves. This, coupled with their shorter skull, suggests that they had an even more powerful bite than other Velociraptorines, meaning that Shri was a capable grappler of an animal, certainly more so adapted to such a niche than their relatives. The crazy thing with all of this is that the specimen may well not have been able to have been studied, as it was illegally poached at some time prior to 2010, and therefore we don't know the exact formation and date from the rocks from which they were found, and was afterwards held in private Japanese and English collections up until being purchased by the French company of Eldonia in 2016, with the skull and the first four articulated neck vertebrae being taken to then be scanned at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences, with these remains as of now having unknown whereabouts which is a testament as to how shaky the field of paleontology can be. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of Paleo Rewinds, and hopefully you learned something new about the discoveries and all descriptions made for the month of July. All of these discoveries and more will be discussed in more detail next year for 2026, as there is much in these papers that I either just simply didn't have the time to cover, 
or would have inflated the video to lengths that would have been much more difficult to get through. The month of August will be covered by Paleopedia, who you can check out here for their video, and the final compilation video will be uploaded on Edge's channel, which you'll be able to check out at the end of the year. With all that, I'll see you next time, whenever that's may be, and I do hope you all have had a very happy holiday season. And so, onwards and upwards for 2026.